when you were talking about NGOs actually doing trafficking, like you don't actually buy that those investigations are not turning out any evidence of them including with smugglers though, are I they? think they are absolutely going and picking up people that are not in distress. Of course, you don't think that's happening? Well, no, because- You don't uh, think this if they just... find a boat of people that are doing just fine, they don't pick them up anyways? Like, cause well, I, I know medic... how I would think if I were doing that, I'd be like, yeah, help them out. Let's pick them up. And then we'll just say they well, were in distress when we get back. Of course they do that. Why would they, again, um, what, because they're globalists or whatever? <laughs> I don't yeah, know. Well, um, yeah, like... because they typically, they want people to come over no matter what. They're open borders. Of course they support that. They just say, yeah, we have to skirt the legal and I know this because we've talked to them. Wait, I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right. How's it going? You're live, by the yeah. way. Yeah, I'm very well. Thanks. How are you? I'm good. Uh, I've only watched the first half of your video, by the way. I, I still have to watch the second half. So if I don't know all the points you've made, that's why I will get around to it. But uh, uh, well, my favorite bit comes next. But that's oh, just no. Typical, <laughs> oh, no. What, what's that it's one fine. about? Uh, te the 10 tons of HIV. Oh, the, the 10 tons of HIV. Okay, well, I will watch the whole thing. But what did you think about my commentary on the first half? What are your thoughts on that? Uh, I only caught the last few minutes. I was in like another part of the house doing stuff. But um, okay, no yeah, worries. Um, I was I was like, I only asked to call because you skipped over the pit where I said that the lead up to the interview. Yeah, I went, someone asked me to go back. I didn't think and I did. the whole, and obviously I saw that you interviewed. I put that in my video. I show you interviewing panels. Yeah. So, um, so like, what did you yeah, think actually, went, went on there? Like, what did you think was happening? Did you think we were like, I just, like faking okay, it um, all? My, uh, well, no, my sister is a journalist. I know <laughs> that people do film stuff after the fact. I just thought the whole, like the evidence board and the, uh, like the shipping app stuff, I just, and like the porn acting, I just thought that was kind of funny, you know? But like you um, introduced it as Lauren Southern is a lying f fake journalist. Well, what I thought with that When you was just said, you know, your sister does this and people set up shots. Well, they don't, they don't build fake evidence boards like three weeks later. That's, that's something I think that's maybe limited to the alternative media. It, it wasn't a fake evidence board, though. It was just an evidence board that was on the wall that we actually did end up using. It was a bit of a I mean, prop I'll... for sure, but it wasn't like fake. <laughs> okay, I'll take your word. So uh, about um, Panos's lawyer. Yep. Um, saying the phrase, we were laundering it. Yep. You have the full footage of that. Of interest. I can get it. Yeah, it's all on hard drives. I, they're actually they would be hard drives in London, not here, since because I'm just one. I'm, I'm, and I'm not. I'm just very uh, intrigued about the idea of a lawyer who would like admit that. He well, was he didn't know it. He, he didn't. Stranger. He had no idea he was being recorded. Obviously. Yeah, but even just speaking to a total stranger as a lawyer, like you'd think well, you'd know better. Of course, there was a, and I, I won't lie about this. There's obviously with journalism, and this has happened to me the other way around, where I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I thought this person was actually sympathetic to me. There's a degree of you have to be like, yes, I'm super sympathetic, otherwise people won't be honest. Unfortunately. Yeah. So what I was thinking with, um, so is there more clarification? off that recording because the, the two big things I felt that were very missing from that um, interview with the lawyer was no clarifying question. So him following up saying we, we were laundering it. We don't know if that's him describing the charges, right? Or actually oh, okay. saying- I, You know what, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna we ask my, all of the, all, I do not have it on my computer here, the hard drives with all of that footage on it. Um, when we were traveling, so we went to Turkey where we had all of our stuff confiscated. That was uh, after our trip to Greece. We were literally mailing hard drives back to London where my editors were throughout our trip. I didn't take any of them home. I was sent edited copies of the film, full, uh, full transcripts, and usually we would do... Um, like, you know how when you open Discord, you can do a screen share with editing and watching and cutting, we do that. So I don't own all of the footage on my own hard drive. I have obviously all the final copies, but I can absolutely request and source that if you want more context. Yeah, um, It'll probably take me I just, did you, uh, a minute, but I'm Did you edit that, that video? Did you edit that video? Um, yeah, it was part of the editing for sure. And well, it's, I just been, wonder it's been why like three would... years. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, was... I know. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna try to put you on your on the spot or anything. No, no, no. I'm like I'm happy why, to actually like... source it because I I know for a fact we wouldn't misportray anything to that degree, um, especially. Yeah, because in the video, instead of a clarifying question, because again that is one thing I know that journalists are supposed to do. I'm sure you'd agree. You're supposed to ask a because he asks Panos the clarifying question. He asks, "Can I just clarify? You categorically deny the charges." He had mm -hmm. to make him say it twice. 
with mm-hmm. the question preceding it. Whereas all I hear is, I think it's Kaylin's voice going, what? As in like, just making up like, a, like almost just a grunt. So that's not, there is no clarifying question. And we, we don't know the lawyer's name. Yeah, so okay, George, George was yeah. talking to him off to the side. Um, but yeah, I can, I can go and grab the full footage because I have no doubt in my mind that that is exactly what he said. And you know what? Uh, uh, did you end up going over the Ariel Ricker footage as well in your film, in your little video? Um, no, I think Jose, the YouTuber, had already covered that to kind of an extent. And it wasn't, it kind of was relevant to NGOs, but this was, uh, most of my data was specifically Around. NGOs in the central Mediterranean. Not, okay, so yeah, because like, it's, it's no that. secret that like these NGOs are often partaking in sketchy activities, especially after talking to Ariel Ricker. She was like, yeah, absolutely. We have people that, you know, go and take jet skis across the water. We call them angels and they grab people and bring them over. Um, We absolutely are training people how to get refugee status, pretending they're Christian and persecuted because as you know, you even mentioned it in your video, Turkey is a refugee safe country. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm, I'm very curious, what country in particular are Christians getting persecuted and that Muslims aren't? Well, Turkey is majority Islamic, so that's what the claim would be coming from, because it's really difficult, obviously. When when I was in um, Lesbos, there's a place called the uh, Life Jacket Graveyard, and it's, we, we put footage of it, it's just like hundreds, thousands of life jackets in a pile from people who have just landed on the shore. And in it, you can find people's documents, like partially burned or thrown away. And typically that's because they've been told by traffickers or by NGOs, you can't have your documentation on you because you can be deported if you have your passport and you've come from like a non-refugee country. Um, Or if you've already got refugee status, obviously you're going to be sent back because it's like, no, you're already, you can't country shop. You've already been given yeah, safe yeah, that, asylum. No, so no, that, we, that's, 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 what that's, I'm saying yeah. is we found like refugee papers for Turkey in this pile. Yeah, so what I'm asking about is the thing with the Christians thing, because like I know, well, the main refugee countries, I suppose, where there's like Christian, Christians being persecuted would be Nigeria, right? Because of um, uh, Boko Haram. That's why that's like the main country where like a persecuted Christian under a Muslim regime would come from. But then I don't know why you would have to say you're Christian to prove you're persecuted because Muslims get persecuted by Boko Haram as well. Well, no, this is in Turkey. They're claiming in Turkey, I face persecution for whatever reason. Um, so this is people coming from Turkey. So they're not necessarily saying it's going to stick, but your your chances of getting a refugee status after traveling through Turkey. Well, uh, the claim could be you, like, as a persecuted Christian from X country, I don't feel hmm. safe in a majority Muslim country again. I need to come to Europe. Uh, you don't, well, you don't actually need to prove that you're, you know, you don't need to stay in the first safe country you arrive in, though. That's not the law. So you can country shop? Is that, um, like, can you, can really... you, can you cite where that comes from? Well, I'm just saying what the, well, it's a, it's the United Nations uh, Convention on Refugees. Can you read that? Like, I'd be curious. To... Yeah, I'll show, okay, there is a common misconception. I'll mm-hmm. find it. It's... It was it article 30 what my notes for this enormous because but all of the all of the uh you know certainly i've gone to the european union a couple times and spoken to the people who are policy makers on this and that was one of the number one contentions that was always spoken about by policy makers yeah, was the so problem of country within, shopping so within europe there is the dublin regulation uh, which says uh you don't have to stay in the first safe country but it might it'll probably harm your claim if you do, but that's within Europe. But that's within Europe, so that's, right? Um, so that doesn't yeah, include so Turkey. Not for doesn't include Turkey. And even the thing within Europe, you could say the United Nations still has a problem with that because uh, the whole logic of saying you don't have to stay in the first safe country is you're just putting a very arbitrary burden on whichever country is next door, right? Like the fact that if you're if the nearest safe country is a country of like five million people and they're massively in debt then it would make sense as an international community to allow people there to move onwards. So that's why the idea of safe third countries, and I mentioned this in the video as well, but mm-hmm. I'll there's also I'll the, the thing. yeah, so that's the thing about, for, I'm trying to find this, um, where is it? 
Because um, I obviously that really does. Um, that's one thing that I spoke to a lot of migrants about when I was on the ground. They were like, man, we really, and I, we didn't film all of it because obviously a ton of migrants told us like, no, we're not comfortable being on footage. We don't want to be filmed. And we respected that. We really made sure we only um, filmed people, especially if they were migrating and potentially, you know, escaping a violent regime in some cases, because I do believe genuine refugees exist within that. Well, I think the majority are um, typically just migrating for economic reasons. Um, and when we, we were talking to people off camera that didn't necessarily want to be filmed, they were often, quite often telling us like, man, like, yeah, we were really screwed over being told we could actually get refugee status in these countries. We were really screwed over being given this false information that we were going to be given somewhere to live, be given asylum, because we're being told we're illegal migrants, especially because the traffickers will tell them to destroy their passports so they actually have no way to even apply. And, and to be fair to the governments, how are you supposed to give refugee status to someone who has no ability, isn't from a refugee, you know, de designated country, has no ability to prove who they are, and has zero ability to prove what their background is, or even their identity. Yeah, okay, so, I, like, I cover, I mean, I cover that as well. Like, I, there are supposed to be, um, there are supposed to be international laws around assisting people who don't have documents, because there can actually be a few reasons. Like, some of it can be, uh, you can be from a country that is absolutely riddled with human rights abuses, but uh, you can be going to a country like Italy, where they consider Libya a safe country, which it absolutely isn't. So okay. um, yeah, like you can have, uh, but again, like that's uh, that's just more of like kind of a separate issue. I can send you that um, law of, but yeah, that is like something that I covered a little bit as well, but I've sent you the link there. The article in the uh, UN law is contracting states shall not impose uh, shall not impose penalties on account of their illegal entry or presence on refugees who are coming directly from a territory where their life or freedom was threatened. So that's why the term coming directly gets misconstrued, but then there are separate UN articles where they explain that coming directly is based on whether or not they claimed asylum and got settled. So if they claimed asylum and got settled in Turkey, and then destroyed that and tried to go somewhere else, that would be a crime. Okay, that so, would be. yeah, yeah, but yeah. If they just got, but if they just got to Turkey and then decided to move afterwards before claiming asylum, that's fine. Okay, so I see what you mean there, and that actually tends to be a big problem is they won't actually apply, not as in they won't apply, they'll try, but they won't have the actual background to be able to get refugee status in a country because they, they don't have a genuine claim to it. So then they'll try to country shop and see which country will let them claim it because they don't actually have a claim. And that's that tends to be the pro problem there, which is a big question I wanted to ask you. Do you see a difference between migrants and refugees and do you think that difference is important yeah i mentioned that as well yeah don't worry yeah. sorry yeah um, just i just thought so again. for the you'll probably notice i feel like i'm just repeating my own script you'll probably uh notice that i used migrant and refugee kind of interchangeably yes. in that video yeah because that, it's a big that's, pet peeve that's of mine. kind of it's a pet peeve of mine as well and it's because that's what they are at sea you don't know ngos can't assess someone's legal state even mary nostrum didn't have the power to assess legal status of someone they rescued. They take them to the uh, country, whichever they're registered to, or just whichever country respects the dignity of those saved. And then the country decides whether or not they're a refugee or a migrant. So that's why um, you can't really call them either. Which so is why, why do you use refugee then? When you um, I use migrant it's as well. It's a bit well. biased. <laughs> no, no, I've used both because okay. it is both, it's both. There's. I don't think there's ever been a boat that had 100% no refugees. I don't think I've seen that anywhere. I looked. I don't know, because there would be a lot, I mean, any boat with the majority North Africans, which we've seen absolutely would be people that would not have, a lot anyways, would not have legitimate claim. Yeah, well, that, but again, the point, is, the point is here is that we're talking about what happens at sea and the idea is at sea how do you find out you don't send them back you find out by processing them in a country where they can be processed and north but african how do you countries process again, people like, who are destroying their identification and lying there are there are processes to that like you, it does take a long time but there are ways around that like that i mean this is like there are un articles about this and what you're supposed to but do but can because, you see again, that people are deliberately doing this to make it difficult to ascertain who they are perhaps because they don't actually of course fit into i can refugee status 
Of course I can, and that's why it's a crime. It's a crime to, if you're found out doing that, or if like you go through a because these vetting processes are pretty like interrogatory, aren't they? Like they grill them pretty hard to find these things out. And most refugees, like they, they come on their own because it's the it's very dangerous to come with your family across the Mediterranean. They come on their own, and then you can have to find out who their family is. And if they give you a name and you can't find who they are, then they they get stuck as well. So like even people who do that get stuck in a gray zone and that can become quite difficult for all parties, which is why I think um, like, yeah, that's like a problem with the smuggling business, which is why I think you agree with me that Mary Nostrum should come back because Actually, smugglers yeah. are, should not be like, should not be doing this. I think rescue missions are fine. It turns out that there was actually something in the BBC just yesterday that there are people crossing on dinghies like that they just uh, like they just buy them and then go themselves because they can't find smugglers. So like, yeah, that's what the rescue missions are for is for people who are going to come regardless of what's happening. But yeah, absolutely. Like smugglers, like getting people to destroy their documents is insane. Like they shouldn't be doing that. Yeah. And to me, like is obviously, and this is something that people really misunderstand. And I, I think I, I don't agree with how you portrayed it. You were kind of like, yeah, Lauren thinks it's based and awesome that people just, you know, shut down missions to help people. Like, of course I don't want people drowning. And that's why I personally support the Australian system, which has led to zero people drowning. But that doesn't work if you just get rid of the NGOs. You actually have I to have a question close about that, the borders then. as well. Uh, because I have you still a question about draw. that though. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, so Italy tried to do something very similar to this. Um, that what they did was they do you know the memorandum that they did with libya the um, coast guard explain it so salvini signed i think it was actually pre-salvini but uh, yeah they um they signed a memorandum with libya basically getting them to do you have your headphones on i do i'm just yeah no, you just moved it okay <laughs> um they signed a memorandum with uh libya the libyan coast guard saying that um they would financially support libyans to rescue people and then bring them back to Libya. That was like their border policing strategy, right? Okay, so wait, they would pay pe Sorry, can you explain that? I hurt myself trying to open my beer. I apologize. The Italian... <laughs> it's an interesting technique. The, uh, yeah, the Italians paid the Libyan Coast Guard to intercept migrants slash refugees mm -hmm. to bring them back to Libya. They were supporting the, the Libyan Coast Guard to intercept people on dinghy boats and bring them back to Libya. Yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they do things like that anyways, everywhere, without any sort of, Like, when I was in Turkey, there were gendarme looking for us when we were on the water, like in helicopters. So they, oh. they tend to... Like, border security tends to happen both ways in countries like that because the smuggling is so bad for Libya and Turkey as well. Um, but like that, to so, me, from my understanding, that happens anyways. Like it was happening when I was in Morocco yeah. too. When I was talking to the traffickers, they were like, oh, we, we keep monitoring of when the Moroccan Coast Guard are in certain areas for when we launch our boats. Hmm. So my question to you is, is that like what you, uh, assuming that like the smuggling business in Libya is massive, it's yeah. not really comparable to Australia where um, I think the numbers of smuggling uh, like is comparatively lower because Libya is a big country. Um, um, so I'm just wondering what you th there's a, there's think should be done. There's a lot of smuggling that does happen to... from from Asia. So my so question is, if you're did. so if you're intercepting people who are supposedly who you know they say are fleeing uh, war, or terror, or whatever, and you stop them making that journey or just send them back, then. Where the question is like you might be stopping drowning. I don't really know about Australia. I didn't mm -hmm. look that. I didn't look into that. But if you apply that to Europe, then it's the question becomes: if they're not drowning, then where are they going? And in the case of Libya, there, which Generation Identity wanted to do, they wanted to send them back to Libya. Well, in the case of Libya, you end up in a detention center where you are tortured, abused. You have a forced disappearance. You're trafficked within Africa. Basically, like you didn't drown, but you might as well be dead. You know, like if you get if you get intercepted by the Libyan Coast Guard and brought back to Libya, that's your life over. You're just a sack of meat with no human rights. OK, so see that that's that's an interesting question, because is that not a problem with the Libyan system in general, as is with many systems worldwide, many that don't qualify for refugee status, but just have extremely 
you know, authoritarian regimes in most of the world, um, rather than that of enforcing... Hmm. Well, it's an authoritarian regime that Italy is supporting, though, and that Generation Identity was happy to send rescuees back to before determining their migration status. So if Generation Identity was rescuing people who they didn't think, know were refugees let, let me ask. and sending them back to Libya. So, OK, this is actually something that's really interesting to me. What do you think would happen to you if you were a refugee caught leaving Turkey by the gendarme and or a migrant or refugee caught leaving Turkey by the gendarme and brought in? Um, I don't know. I didn't look into Turkey. Probably bad, right? Well, that's the, that's the thing. There's an assumption that you'll be treated horribly by these countries, right? Mm -hmm. You know, they're these yeah. uh, horrible persecution countries that... Uh, so I was arrested by the gendarme, essentially as a migrant, because we were found on illegal border territory. We didn't realize it was illegal territory. Uh, we were trying to get filming of the border, and they arrested us as though we were migrants trying to leave the country. And even more so, I was with two... Uh, gay film guys, and I am a woman who has done qu quite a lot of anti-Islam commentary. We were terrified, to say the least, right? And one of the big assumptions was, you know, as a as a critic of Islam with two gay film guys, we are going to be screwed. This is like Midnight Express. We're going to go to jail. What actually happened is we were brought in by the military. We were held for a while, questioned. They actually brought in a doctor to check and make sure our health was okay. And we hadn't been beaten or attacked or anything happened to us by the guards. Uh, she actually, I remember her walking in and almost falling backwards. She was, she was so shocked to see that we were white because she's like, I'm so used to dealing with, you know, migrants that are like Middle Eastern. Not, not white people trying to cross borders, but she's like, yeah, it's my full-time job. I come in and make sure everyone's healthy. They gave us chicken, they gave us cookies and cigarettes. And they quest the questioning part was a bit more serious and intense after like 10 hours of being told we might face jail time. But we were actually treated really, really well. Um, so I do wonder, and, and you know what? I, I was pulled in for questioning in Morocco too. Where I what, saw, are you, what are you suggesting here? I'm, I'm, what are you what suggesting, I'm suggesting here about Libya? What I'm suggesting, I, I'm, I'm about to finish here. Morocco, I saw someone get beaten by the police when I was pulled in for questioning, uh, which was horrific, but I also saw people just being talked to. What, what I'm suggesting is, like, does that exact thing happen in every single scenario? Like, I, I'll, I'll have to look into it a bit more, but is that, like, the protocol of the Libyan police that we... If, if you are caught on a diggy and we bring you back, we f*** you and beat you, and that is, like, indefinitely your fate. Like, what is the research and data on that? Like, I, I don't well, doubt in some cases that does happen, and that is horrific, but is that the actual protocol? What, like, do you have... I, I just feel like there are a lot of... Um, well, like, if they have, like, if they have a, a guidebook saying you should get out of refugees or just whether or not it happens, because there was a spike after that memorandum was... Uh, drawn up, there was a spike in detentions and detention-related abuses in Libyan detention centers. So, um, yeah, like, I mean, okay, let, let's say it happens to what, like, a 10% of the people who are intercepted? That's still you sending, like, people who you haven't determined the migration status of. You don't know whether they're legit or not, but you've sent them to a dangerous situation. By the way, Libya is, uh, decided by the UN to not be a safe port. They emphatically say okay. you can't send people to rescue back to Libya. Okay, when was that brought in? Because for me, it's it's all about like actually applying the the maritime law, actually applying the migration law. So if it is What's the maritime law again? Well, first in, of all, in... first of all, you know, you <laughs> you have to return people to the closest safe port. So if that is Turkey, no, you, you return them to you Turkey. Don't. So you don't yeah, have you don't to, have to... Sorry, go on. Okay, um, you know, not migrating when you have no refugee status. And how do you, like, this is always a big question to me, because if the question becomes, there is, if I am at sea and I leave a certain country and that country is potentially unsafe, like Libya, for me to be returned to, do, what, what happens if their passport has been destroyed? What happens here if they come over and they, you know, won't tell you where they're from, they have no claim to refugee status? The problem is that you are getting an unprecedented amount of people that can't be identified, that if you return to their original point of, um, 
wherever they came from, you are told that you are cruel and horrible and condemning people to death, even if you're not. So how do you enforce any laws? How do you enforce any sort of system that keeps people out before they've shown their passport or proved who they are? when anyone can essentially dub themselves a refugee in danger by just going into the Mediterranean. Well, I think if, uh, well, I mean, most, I think it's like just over half of people get their asylum claims accepted and the rest of them get rejected. So it's actually like, it's a pretty strict process. But then yeah. again, that also means that a lot of people crossing the sea, so given that the sea, the, the central Mediterranean is the most dangerous journey. So you'd expect the numbers of genuine refugees in there to probably be higher, but I can't prove that. Really yeah, bad. someone made um, a good you point were wrong about... too. They were like, if you stop the boats, they won't enter Libya to begin with and put themselves well, in danger. No, that's, that's no, true because, too. no, because although people already face risk of getting intercepted, they still cross. Right, and because when the Mar borders Nostrum are open ended, too. No, and when, no, they're, what, what which, which borders? Because it's not like the Australian policy. If you try to enter the country, you won't, you'll just be sent to Christmas Island if you try to enter Australia. You won't be allowed in the country whatsoever. So while there are still countries that are allowing people entry, they're still going to keep crossing. So you need to end both. And your comparison I watched at the beginning with Mara Nostrum and Triton 1 is just uh, simply, there was only a 7% difference in actual drowning. Still horrific, of course, but that graph makes it seem like way different. And one of the big reasons that increased the amount of drownings wasn't because there was less search missions by Mara Nostrum. It was because they started using more dinghy boats at the time. And dinghy boats, unfortunately, increased over time compared to fishing boats. And they're 20 times as dangerous compared to fishing boats. That's one other possible explanation. Of course, there's also the fact that significantly less traffickers were being arrested. Yeah, I mean, the dinghy boats doesn't really, it doesn't correlate exactly because um, there was an increase in 2016 of dinghy boats. It went from 67 to 82%, but then NGO presence was higher in 2017 than 2016, mm -hmm. but then dinghy boats dropped. So they actually, there's, they don't really connect well, at all. Well, dinghy boats went up the, with Triton 1, which is when the drownings happened, well, and then the they dinghy, continued the dinghy to go boats, up since then. The dinghy boats, well, they, they went up and then dropped. They went up and dropped because for a period in 2016, the smuggling hub was moved to Sabratha in Libya, where the militias had control. And the thing with militias is they can smuggle whoever they want on whatever boat they want, and the customers can't complain. So that's kind of where the that actually fits better because the rescue mission correlation, it correlates for one year, but then it goes negative the other, so it doesn't really fit. Um, I want to bring you back, actually, if yep. you don't mind. You were wrong about the next port of... You were wrong about the next port of safety. The term that the UN uses is uh, next port of call, which can mean the next port of safety. But mm -hmm. they also actually say at the end that there are plenty of instances where this is unclear. Like they actually say it's unclear. But the overriding concern is the safety and uh, of the, and dignity of the crew and the people rescued, which is why it's very contentious sending people to North Africa because um, First of all, like uh, Libya is obviously not a safe port. It's a disaster, which is why I'm still so confused about why Generation Identity wanted to send them there. And then uh, Egypt has had like kind of authoritarian problems. And then Algeria, while well, they recently deported a bunch of migrants without due process. Tunisia, I think actually has a chance, but they, um, they don't really have an asylum process at the moment. So it would probably be useful to start funding that instead of Libya. But yeah, that's why, and obviously different EU countries have different impressions of what a safe country is. But again, I wonder if like, uh, where you're, what you're saying we should do when, when these people are rescued, because the first big spike in refugees happened in 2011, when there wasn't an, a refugee response, but that was because the Libyan civil war happened. So I think the problem with pull factors is you're actually ignoring like push factors, like why do mm -hmm. people leave? Because even on a good year, your chance of dying in the Mediterranean is one in 50. Even when all the rescue missions were there, you are one in 50 chance of dying. So oh, when, when you've got a genuine refugee crisis, I obviously think that's a very different question. But certainly in like 2016, 2017, when I was covering this stuff, like the majority of people that I was meeting in refugee camps were, you know, not from Syria, not from Libya. They were coming from countries which were not um, listed as refugee countries. And that's because these traffickers- Listed by who? 
like not in a current state of civil war or war in general and like actively listed as being able to apply for refugee status which is why there are so many people living under bridges in Europe and living in camps not with refugee status all over the place and this is another aspect that is really horrific like Camp Moria that I went to was burned down just this year because people were so sick of being there they were like I'd rather be back in Turkey right now this this place is horrible and it just becomes a pay your way through system can you actually afford that that's what it becomes when it becomes to the smuggler system it isn't are you an actual refugee? It's, can you afford to pay for the best trip over? And then once you get to Greece, can you afford to pay the doctor for a fake doctor's note that says you need to go to Athens? And then can you afford to pay a lawyer to make a good argument for you, uh, even if you don't have the data? Like, it actually kind of bastardizes the entire process for be getting refugee status, um, sadly. But I, I do have to ask, like, do you understand that there needs to be a limited, uh, this is unfortunate, like st I'm still saying definitely some, but do you understand that there needs to be a limited amount of dependents brought into a country under refugee status in order for that system to function? What do you mean by dependents? So people who obviously are in refugee status are typically leaving their country in a moment's notice. Um, mm. Right now, it wouldn't be somewhere within Europe. There's no country in Europe that is in an active uh, active war other than, I, I mean, you could maybe argue Ukraine. Uh, but so typically people are uh, migrating to countries where they don't necessarily speak the language. They have no connections. In a lot of cases, no family, no, if you're a genuine refugee, no money to pay for a home in a lot of cases, somewhere to live, you need support, undeniably. You're not gonna be able to just waltz in and get a job right away. So mm -hmm. do you recognize that for these people to enter a country and for them to be genuinely supported and put into a position where they can conti continue to live their own life in a meaningful way, that number mm -hmm. has to be limited to a certain amount. Yeah, th that's that's why I don't. That's why I think this first safe country thing is really stupid. Because what happened in Europe was that you had this concentration in like it's southern Italy and southern Spain, places with like places with with uh, massive like economic issues and debts and all that that couldn't like handle more people. Whereas. Uh, they could have easily gone up to places like uh, whether it was like France or Germany or northern Spain or even the UK where the UK definitely Mate, has a labor shortage they're right now. Massively so, full in Italy, massively full in Germany. Like they were, even is, back in 2015, they were all packed in Porte de la Chapelle and um, that right on the, the border. And they were all packed in, sorry, Porte de la Chapelle wasn't near the border. That's, uh, oh my goodness, this is where I got arrested. Why can't I remember the name of it? It's that you have to remember where you get I, I know. How could I not remember this? Too um, many times. Huh? <laughs> starts with a C. I'm gonna get a map up here, but Porte de la Chapelle was like Paris. Uh, map of France. But again, that's why I would say that what the EU should have done, the EU should have actually been able to gather their resources Calais. in a much more Sorry, useful Calais. way. <laughs> Calais, yeah. Which is why the EU should have been able to pull their resources a lot better, so they could allocate people more evenly and in a much more uh pragmatic way whereas right now you have like what is one a much country more pragmatic open... way what is that a pragmatic way is like well one thing is uh getting rid of work bans on people who are currently seeking asylum so if your asylum claim is still happening in the uk you're not allowed to work which is stupid like these people want to work generally and then the other thing is uh just actually looking at ways that different countries might not have the infrastructure to take refugees and other countries do. I don't buy for one second, by the way, that Germany is full. Like there have been refugee crises throughout the centuries of like millions of people arriving in countries of less than 15 million people. And economies can function like that because you add workers to the economy. I think the problem there is typically people who have come in, they actually don't even have the capability to work because in, in Paris may be a bit different. And this was actually quite sad because obviously a lot of people coming from uh, different countries in Africa that had previously been colonized by the French could speak French so they could actually speak the language, but they just had no legitimate claim to asylum. So they couldn't get any papers. They couldn't work because they had no actual right to migrate there. 
Well, that's what I think. Um, that they're was the like that's again that's well, that's why I think that's that's a problem with Paris, uh, with France, and a lot of these countries that are drumming up anti-immigrant sentiment is they're not really thinking about pragmatism. Uh, that whole thing of like just leaving undocumented people under bridges mm -hmm. is a waste. Like those people want to work. That's what they okay, but, said but you to you. They said that why you can't give someone status who hasn't applied for it, right? You understand why you can't just have no immigration laws because every single person worldwide would want to move to France immediately. Um, that was in a poor country. And I'm not saying, like, it, it sucks that there's a large amount of the world that has bo been born in impoverished countries. That's horrible. We want to change that situation. But you can only have so many people that migrate into your country that are largely going to be dependent. So you can't change your migration laws just because someone's already there. Oh, you already came? Well, I guess shrug our shoulders. We'll just give you the right to work and live here if you don't actually fit into the status because then that opens up for everyone. I'll just come over from India. I'll just come over from China. I'll come over from Canada. And I'm, I, can I be French now and work and live here even though I haven't put in any application? That wouldn't fly anywhere in the world. Doesn't matter if it's a European country or not. I wouldn't expect any country to do that for me. I wouldn't move to India and say, hey, give me citizenship because I'm already here anyway. Well, this didn't happen, though, because when the Balkan route opened, most people stayed in Syria and Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey. The vast majority of refugees did not enter Europe from the refugee crisis, barely. Um, yeah. And even when the Balkan route opened, even when Viktor Orban yep. dipshit, was like basically Calm directing down. people what? into West... Even basically directing people with his little half-built walls into, the West, into Western Europe. Like, when he was doing that, People stayed in Lebanon his, and whoa, other places his anyway. His people didn't want mass migration in their country. Are they not allowed to have their opinion and vote on that? <laughs> um, I think if you want to be, I think if you want to be part of the European Union, then yeah, you should probably abide by international laws. Yeah. So you think that the European Union should have more power than the people within a country? On some things, yeah. On some That's things, kind of like... including who should be allowed to enter their country? When it comes to refugees, yeah. Well, we're talking because about migrants. No, we're talking about we're people talking who about are people making who have claims. not been decided. And in a lot of cases, they're moving once again through these countries because the refugee status has been rejected in the first country. Well, how do you... so? Because they How aren't you... actually refugees in a lot of cases. Well, no, you're again, like you're just speaking to like a few examples that you found. You don't know if someone is a refugee or a migrant until they claim asylum. So you need to give them the opportunity to claim asylum. And we have laws against existing in a country and not claiming asylum that actually incurs deportation. So again, how do you know unless they can't arrive? Because what you're saying, and it seems like. What oh, okay, so I, I have no, I, I have friends of mine that are um, like refugees that have immigrated, for example, to Australia, Bosnia, and they were part of their families were in a lot of the the wars in Eastern that were going on in Eastern Europe, um, and you know they they were able to put claims in before they actually left their their country to go to the new country, and that happens in a lot of cases. In fact, that's typically how refugee claims occur. No, that, that can happen. It's not typically how claims occur. Oh, okay, because so what not, if the not embassy... typically, but that is a possibility. And probably looking at the crisis occurring right now is, is the, the better form of making an application than ending up in Camp Moria and having it burned down because you're so miserable where you are and you can't get status because you don't actually have, you found out you don't actually have a right to asylum even though your human trafficker told you you would. Yeah, so again, like, if you can claim asylum through an embassy, people would do that rather than risk a 1 in 50 chance of dying across the sea. Because the thing with the embassy, like you said, it's an option. They don't have to do that. And you probably have to assume that every, every journey into Europe is dangerous. Even the Balkan route is dangerous. So if they're, not, if they're not claiming asylum in the embassy and just coming over instead, it's because that's their human right. That's their right under international law. 
So again, it's an option to claim that assembly. So but what would you do? Uh, what would you do about um, the mass amounts of people? And I do remember reading uh, European Union data. I'd have to go back and find it, saying it was actually the majority who were coming over for economic reasons at one point in around 2016, 2017. What would you do about those who are attempting to make refugee claims, but they're actually just economic migrants? Well, if your refugee claim fails, then you get deported. You should, I mean, that should be the case anyway. So just send them all back? Not all of them, the ones who fail their claims, yeah. Yeah, so you'd, you'd uh, get them on airplanes and send them home? <laughs> what if they've destroyed their passports so you don't know what home is for them? Again, that's like a legal gray zone, but you're, that's not speaking to the larger issues. Like, no, that is the, come over almost, anyway. if you don't have a legitimate claim to refugee status and you're coming from a country that you know you can be deported to and you want to stay, the, a, a lot of them, a large amount, destroy their passports like before they even get to the water. I know, I'm just really, I'm just really interested at, in this claim destroyed about... passports all over the ground. So like, what do you do about that? Because this yeah, is okay, the question like, at hand. I don't, I don't doubt that you saw a bunch of destroyed passports, but again, like, what are the stats on that? Because most people who arrive, as far as I remember, they, they make claims. Well, they attempt to and a lot fail, unfortunately, and then you have a bunch of people stuck in limbo under bridges and in camps, which, as you said, have has uh, increased anti-migrant sentiment all across Europe. It's, it's a problem, and it's a problem that I, I can accept is complex and you bring up good points, but you still, uh, like, you've still massively got the problem when you don't stop w where it's occurring. As you've said, one thing is to potentially stop the push factors, and I am all for investigating and what we can do there. But sometimes the push factors, and in a lot of cases, are just general poverty. And I think if we're speaking in a in a sane manner, we know world poverty is unfortunately just never going to go away. So in that case, you have to go to the next push factor, which is the fact that, you know, you just have a trafficking service, service happening in the Mediterranean and open borders there. So I mean, you were just, are you still describing the NGOs as a trafficking service? Because I thought we kind of just established that they were doing everything within their rights. Oh, I, I think the Mare Nostrum mission that was actually arresting traffickers while picking up people that were genuinely in distress wasn't a trafficking service. But if you are just a service that is going off into, uh, you know, foreign waters, picking people up and bringing them back in, that's a trafficking service, of course. And that was exactly what was occurring. I, I haven't explored Libya, but I've explored the other two largest points, Turkey and Morocco, and that is exactly what was happening there. Well, Morocco, um, okay, but again, NGOs doing, tra like, again, you're, I think when I, fuck, I, I think when you were talking about NGOs, like, actually doing trafficking, like, you don't actually buy that those investigations are not turning out any evidence of them, including with smugglers, though, are I you? think they are absolutely going and picking up people that are not in distress. Of course, you don't think that's happening? <laughs> Well, no, because you don't think uh, this, if they I, this... find a boat of people that are doing just fine, they don't pick them up anyways. Like, because well, I, I know how I would think if I were doing that. I'd be like, yeah, help them out. Let's pick them up. And then we'll just say they well, were in distress when we get back. Of course they do that. Why would they? Again, um, what, because they're globalists or whatever? I don't no, know. Well, um, yeah, like... because they typically, they want people to come over no matter what. They're open borders. Of course they support that. They just say, yeah, we have to skirt the legal thing. And I know this because we've talked to them. Okay, so yeah, that's just, I mean, that's just like, okay, maybe I'm sure that some of the ones you talked to were, but again, like, when NGOs have been accused of this, they have to publish. You can look at the Juventa case. This was one where they actually had to publish every, like all of their logs, like because NGOs film all their missions. They have evidence of them doing this. Do they? And <laughs> I... yeah, you can look up. You can look up the Juventa case if you want. They released all their I'll, archives. I'll go look at it. It can be really. Were... Do you actually have the court for documents? Because it can be so difficult. Like with the Panos case, um, like they're actually ERCI are still under investigation. You know. Like they're, like I know they are. So, I mean, the, the Aquarius are still under investigation for dropping AIDS into the sea. You know, these investigations. <laughs> yeah, so these investigations aren't aren't over. And as we both know, sometimes <laughs> excuses will be made that are legitimate, but are made to actually discover further criminal activities. So someone 
someone who's a massive gang member will be arrested for, you know, having paw on them, but the intention will be to further an investigation into their activities or give the police rights to be able to uh, have a search warrant for their home to find something bigger. And I assume certainly Salvini, and I, I at least think you'd agree with this, Salvini and the prosecutors working with him are probably hoping to investigate more with this case than just AIDS blankets. Yeah, but why would I, I don't know if I can trust anyone who's worried about AIDS blankets. But um, anyway, um, what I'm yeah, saying the is thing there with, is a bigger thing going on than just the AIDS blankets. But the but AIDS you blankets don't know that. Are like, what they you... were able to get them on because, of course, they've been accusing them of people trafficking for years. So, of course, but I know again, that. I so, know they think that. <laughs> yeah. So do you why the AIDS blankets, though? That's so because weird. they could catch them on that because they actually have the, the physical. How can you how port, can you catch here's someone? The clothing, here's the. How can I mean, you catch someone in AIDS blankets, though? It's HIV-infected clothes, as you, as you stated on your, your video from. But you can't get HIV from clothes. What do you mean? So it's it's clothing that has been contaminated. Yeah, you can't get clothing. You can't get HIV from clothes. Even if there's blood on the clothes, you can't get HIV from like touching HIV like clothes. HIV let's, dies let's, as soon as Let's look up, let's look up, well, okay, well, let's look it up, because there must be we some sort of CDC, law that they're we? going under. <laughs> like, yeah, I assume they, were they going, aren't contaminated. They were, going, they were going under toxic waste, but right. again, like, clothes, uh, the clothes of people who have HIV is not toxic waste. It was laid, it was just labeled as special waste, and that was it, like. Okay, well, I, I'd have to look into the law because I'm sure like medical clothing, you know, when you go into a hospital and there's like the blood bins, you throw it in there and it's considered toxic yeah, waste to so... people who have diseases. So, I, I mean, I assume there was some legal precedent for that. As I said, I have not done a full legal analysis of your video and it can be, and I'm after doing your research, I am sure you would agree with this. It is a bitch to find European actual case documents, especially using like English Google having to mm -hmm. put in all the little preferences and be like, no, put it in Greek. No, from this time. No, legal cases, Google Scholar. And it's just like you're getting yeah. to the 11th page of Google. <laughs> this one I'm going to send you actually has like images as well of the. Uh, yeah, contaminated the medical yeah. waste or biohazard. Yeah, but it's, again, it's not a biohazard if it's clothes that someone who had AIDS wore. <laughs> like, it's just such a strange accusation. It's like, I we'll think I know why they more, did it. I because... assume the media, like, as we both know, the media like to, they're like AIDS blankets. <laughs> they won't well, actually... No, this is what the prosecutor said. They okay, said it well, was let's... clothing contaminated. Okay, do you have the actual like prosecution document not interpreted by the media? Is that what you had? Because you're the one that made the claim. I got the claim from you. Well, that's what I read from the media, that that's why the ship was shut down. So you took the media at their word. I'm doing the same. So like, I'm, I'm just saying, saying that's why the ship that was shut said... down. But I, if, you're, if you're saying that it's like a, a bizarre legal claim that has no precedent, I, we'd have to actually look at the legal documents. Like, well, I, don't like, need, I, I, I get even, what you're saying, like, oh, it. you can't catch HIV from just this clothes. Well, well, let's see what the actual Well, I know why they said, because claims. if you accuse someone of something, that has to get investigated. And if you say they were mismanaging toxic waste, then they have to investigate that. Mm -hmm. But since the toxic waste they're referring to is clothes of people who had HIV, Right. Okay. Well, like I said, I'll have to actually look into what laws are around that and why they have that law in. And that's just what I know that the ship was initially impounded and shut down by Italy anyways. I know it had been impounded and shut down in multiple other countries before for their activities. But um, yeah. What other activities were they impounded for? I just know that other countries had taken away their their license and ability before. No, that's not that's not impounding though. If they take away their, I mean, there's a whole. I'm pretty the sure they were impounded in Spain as well. Impounded. Were they impounded by Spain or were they just there? Let's see. I know because I, I know their charge is for AIDS clothes. Like that's what they're that's what they're under investigation for. <laughs> It's so hard to find information on the Aquarius case, though. I was like, I couldn't find anything in the last year from the short Googling I did before. Well, I'm just wondering um, why you brought okay, it up. Wait, wait, wait. Because... because I'm saying like that beyond just people are like, you're trying to be a, um, you know, a non-government enforcer of the law, Lauren. And I'm like, well, the government have actually impounded and, you know, well, they taken didn't the ship impound... in themselves. Well, no, they, they took the ship in a year after. 
you did your thing with the boat. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Like the the yeah, ship. Yeah, so there was nothing. Had there was been, actually, the ship like, had no. been accused of illegal activity, mm. and they had been taken in and impounded by the government, and were not allowed to sail anymore. So people were accusing me of being this force of like you think you're above the law, but I'm like, no, the law actually decided that the ship was problematic as well. And we'll have to yeah, go through they, the specific were... things that they have put forward. That was one of the reasons, the toxic waste, which I'm sure there is more to that than just what the media have reported, because we'll have to get the exact case documents. But that was the reason the government have impounded the ship and the government have decided that there was at least some premise or standing for them to do that and to stop their missions. Mm -hmm. Again, like, so yeah, the, again, toxic waste didn't come up until after. That was, that, that's post talk. Um, and again, trafficking, I don't even, there wasn't even an investigation or, or like a charge. There it's was just, an investigation. Like people, the investigation didn't start until 2018, didn't it? 2017, 2018? So there was an investigation. Oh, but you're yeah, saying Yeah, I know there was an investigation, after. but it didn't, yeah, it happened after, didn't it? Um, because yeah, you weren't talking about them, you were talking about them irrelevant, bringing because the illegals. point was, the point was that there's there are illegal migrants coming in that don't actually have refugee status and we're finding that out more and more going forward that these people don't actually have claim to refugee status and something needs to happen about this because at the moment whew, sorry about to sneeze yeah so this, this again this has nothing to do with um with illegal activity or infected blankets okay the, the first illegal activity is migrants coming in without refugee status so they're committing the is illegal, illegal it's activity not, well, the boat. What the boat like the is the boat doing that because the boat's supposed to take people to the next port of call, which was Italy. The boat was supposed to do that. I I'm still not sure. So let's see. Can you send me? Can you link me that European Union document? Next port of call. Next port of call is. Let me find it. I think I've got it open here. It's UN. Uh, here we go. Yeah, it's actually That's in UN. the DMs. It's in the the one that ends in 9-4 PDF. And if you just look at page eight, next port of call. So that's UN though. Someone in chat's calling me laundry box. That's really funny. Laundry box. <laughs> oh, I hate doing research while on stream, but let's see this. All right. I just, I'm sorry, I don't I want to be rude. Find... I, just, I, I, I don't want to be rude, but <laughs> I feel like, I feel like this is the kind of research you'd want to do before making claims against a refugee boat that's safe. Well, no, at, at the time I had, of course, done, done a lot of the research. It's been, what, 2017, 18, 19, 20, 21. It's been like five years, right? Four or five years. Mm. It's been a minute since I've been looking into this ship and its actions. And the first time I've done a whole lot of looking into it was probably that last video I did, the vindicated one you reviewed. And then like yesterday mm. doing a bit of Googling about the, and looking through some of the data you posted below your video. So it's been a minute since I've actually done a look into the update and in borderless, obviously I was reporting on the specific organizations between Turkey and Greece and Morocco and Spain, which is why I have a lot more to say on them right now than I do about the Aquarius, because that's been the most recent research I've done into it. Okay. Um, um, so I'm not again, seeing like, anything so maybe, about next maybe, port of call in this document you sent me. It's if you control find, if you I control did. find, uh, are you on page eight, next port of call? Or did you send me something after that? Blaming the rest? No, I oh, sent you something after. One, yeah. I said uh, 94, yeah, dot 94 PDF. So this is UN though. Yeah, that's uh, what I said. Note. I said it was UN. United Nations High Commission. Oh, of course my quick search isn't working. Oh, find on page, there we are. Okay. A ship. Port of call. Uh, which page was it? Eight? Clearly. Eight. It it's uh, section 30. Okay, there we go. Next port of call. In summary, the executive committee, blah, 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 blah. Take... 
In summary, the executive committee pronouncement taken into conjunction with the obligation under international maritime law to ensure delivery to a place of safety call upon coastal states to allow disembarkation of rescued asylum seekers at the next port of call. Uh, in accordance with international practice, support by the relevant international instruments, persons rescued at sea should normally disembark at the next port of call. This practice should also be applied to asylum seekers rescued at sea in cases of large-scale influx. Asylum seekers rescued at sea should always be admitted, at least on a temporary basis. States should assist in facilitating their disembarkation by acting in accordance with the principles of international solidarity and burden-sharing in granting resettlement opportunities. Okay, so this is UN. Now, of course, not everyone agrees to or signs on to UN uh, rules, as we know. So what is I it? I know, it's just, that you brought, it's just that you brought up maritime laws. Okay, but yeah, so that's, so, that's what I'm though. saying. Let's look at the maritime laws that actually cover Italy. Like, is this the maritime no, this law? Is, this, is, this is maritime law. This is, um, it's, yeah, it's that, well, background note on the protection of asylum seekers and refugees rescued at sea. But international that's just maritime one... law. Okay. Yeah, this is international maritime law, yeah. I'm going to have to actually look into this a bit more because I'm not sure I'm not sure if from the time that I was looking into this it was definitely the closest port you have to drop them off at if it is someone at sea. So and again well first of all I think the qualifier even if that's true in the case of the Aquarius the closest it would be the closest port of safety. Libya is not a port of safety. Morocco is further away the Moroccan waters are further away from Spain, let alone Italy. So. And I also wonder, because this is a document entirely. I like how someone is quote, someone in your chat is quoting like half of the paragraph and saying it debunks me. That's really funny. What do they say? Sorry. There he's may be just, instances where the, the next thing. port of yeah. call may not be the closest one, but rather the one best equipped for the purposes of receiving traumatized and injured victims and subsequently processing mm. any asylum applications. In other situations involving state vessels intercepting illegal migrants, the nearest port of that state could be regarded as the most appropriate port for disembarkation purposes. So I, I do think that this does say intercepting illegal migrants, you put them in the most appropriate state which means the state they came from. Would you not agree? Where, where, well, how do you know they're illegal if you found them at sea? <sighs> Maybe if they're coming through trafficker vessels through countries, which typically have no one with migrant applications like Turkey, which is a safe second country, or like Morocco, which the vast majority of people are okay. not coming with, mig with asylum Again. applications. Again, or, being from a sorry, coming ahead. from a safe country, some coming from a country. Well, first of all, this is, again, these people came from Libya. They come from Libya, not Turkey. And again, they're in the so they're in the sea from Libya, and being in a safe country, even if they were, doesn't instantly make you an illegal immigrant. The people who rescue them are not determining their legal status. How do you know they're illegal when you found them at sea? Like, I don't know what to tell you. There's a reason why Australia has the policies they do and why they have worked so well and why Europe is currently dealing with a bunch of people living under bridges and burning down migrant camps in Greece. What is happening where right did now the, is where not did, Okay, working. again, that's just, okay, so why are you making all these claims then if you just want them all to get sent to, like, wherever, Christmas Island, or even just to stay oh, okay, in the well, country maybe, that maybe they would that otherwise Maybe that is a solution. Leave. Maybe they should be sent to an island to be processed first, so there isn't this drive factor which is saying, yeah, you get into Europe and you can just keep shopping around until someone accepts your asylum claim and if they don't well the trafficker has probably lied to you and told you that they'll get it anyways like there there are like can we at least agree something needs to change because right now it's not working it, and if you hold the policy which you're suggesting which is you just let everyone in because you may or may not know if they are a migrant or not that's gonna that result is what we already do yeah and it's not yeah. working it's not working it's not working because people are First of all, they keep on declaring countries like Libya as safe countries, like which is kind of difficult. And then the second thing so is, so should anyone from really... Libya be able to come? Like, should the entire country of Libya, every single person who lives there, be able to come to Europe? You don't and have not to do a, you no, don't have to go like with that... this. You don't. You don't have to go with the with the with the slippery slope fallacy again. No, it's not a slippery slope. Do that That's, and you actually do it. have to consider these things. Like, should anyone from Libya be allowed to come to Europe and claim refugee status? 
Do you say anyone or everyone? Again, that's anyone. different. Because it should, yeah, anyone. Anyone. Yeah. In Libya, yeah. And Unless they're like no, 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 no. Like, again, claim. Unless they're like, I don't know if they're part of whatever that group's called. Not the GNA, the other ones. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but again, you have to find that in the processing, sir. Uh, in the in the processing. So what what do you do when you like? Let's see. How many refugees? Do you think there needs to be a cap on refugees and migration in countries? Like an absolute number? Yeah. I don't think so, no. So, and I know you're going to call this a slippery slope, but the amount of people who are in poor countries in turmoil actually probably mm. outweighs the amount of countries that are not in turmoil and have a bit of wealth. Yeah, and believe it or not, most of them never like, like have the opportunity to come to Europe now and they don't do it. Why is everyone calling this open borders? Like we already have, like the international law for refugees is already open borders and people don't leave. Well, no, Most a lot people of people stayed in Jordan, they, Lebanon. They, can't. they just don't have the ability and they know that they wouldn't be, they, they probably realize they'll be sleeping under bridges because there's just no more money to support them in a lot of these countries. There's no more, the systems are overburdened. Well, they do. I mean, I think typically they would know. Like if I if I had the money right now, I'm not joking. I would take you on a trip, and I promise you right now, I'm pinky swearing. If I win the lottery, and you have to promise back to me, I will take you on a trip. You can come with me on a trip to Morocco. We'll go to Porte de la Chapelle. We'll go to Calais. We will go to uh, the Greek islands, and we'll meet these people. And you can tell me if you think that. Uh, we should be letting everyone in Europe and if this No, this Lauren, I'm not going to I'm not going to go on a little trip and like no, with a bunch of preconceived No, no, no I'm not going to go You don't have to accept anything I say. I'm just saying I'll take you there and you can go loose, have your own time. Yeah, have a drink because beer, I, everyone. I mean, I personally don't agree with the idea of going like with a bunch of preconceived notions and just looking at I didn't things. tell you to have really preconceived notions. I told you I'd just take you there to see it for yourself. Everyone everyone goes with preconceived notions. That's why well, I Well your to preconceived look at the data. notions are probably against my opinions anyways. So Well like you yeah, exactly, but me finding something I like finding something that suits me and using it against you wouldn't prove anything. I could just film a bunch of cherry picked situations no, but, and then like, say like this proves my case. Again, like like this is what happens though when you do things that way is you end up forgetting about maritime laws on ports of safety or go following through with cases on AIDS blankets. You have nothing. Like you just end up making like these kind of strange like kind of proxy arguments. So again, like what are you what do you what do you want to do with these people when like even generation identity, I want to, I'm asking again, I'm not sure if you've answered yet. People getting rescued in the sea. They don't have to be an NGO, they can just be a commercial vessel going fishing. What are they supposed to do? What, what do you mean, what are they supposed to do if they're a commercial vessel fishing? Like, if you're a commercial vessel and, you've, and you uh, receive a distress call, maritime laws, you have to rescue yeah, them. Course. What do you do? So what do you do? What do you do with them? Of course, if you are Or even a generation identity, what? If you are receiving a distress call, you have to help them. That is, of course, mm -hmm. maritime law. But going out into waters and with the deliberate intention of picking people up in boats working for some of these ngos that are deliberately coaching people to try to get them refugee status they don't apply for uh as they've told us it, having missions where you go out on sea dues every day and pick people up and bring them over like something needs to change here and perhaps that change is only allowing embassy applications for refugee status the same way they do in australia or only allowing the application to come from a place like christmas island maybe they get but an thought, island where they make all the applications happen from there um, but and i thought you were saying making that you it okay. making it happen from somewhere which is already like largely inhabited uh, tends to ruin that island and cause a lot of conflict because you have a bunch of people anyone doesn't matter where you're from or what your background is i'd be the same a bunch of people with no hope no opportunity uh, no no status for no potential future because they've destroyed their identification and they can't apply for refugee status putting all those people in one place whether it be in italy or an island or in the middle of france causes a lot of violence and chaos and destroys communities so you have to ask yourself right now the system is not working it's not working uh do we keep going as we're going and that well, seems to be your suggestion because no, I'm saying the Australian hey, system is hey. better. Just shut it all down. 
because you can't even help I the did people not in your say, own country. I did not say keep going. First of all, distress calls can be uh, received from uh, boats that are docked or coast guards. The Italian coast guard does like, well, like a quarter of the rescues in some years. So even you're not going to get rid of the entire coast guard, right? Because that would mean there'd be a potential for rescue missions. I didn't say so, to get rid of again, the entire coast guard. Well, yeah, but the coast guard can do rescue missions. So again, so you're saying like rescue missions will happen, people will move, and then what they get put into a detention I, 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 I don't know I feel like I'm going to look at there, there needs Australia to be... for the next day or two and <laughs> yeah. find that there's massive like human rights abuses happening in Christmas Island and again if they can't come over to Australia where do they go do they stay in the island that they would a lot of people live there for fleeing? a long time a lot of people live on Christmas Island for a long time but it's a question of how many people are in Christmas Island right now let me see it's it's the amount of people that actually leave and try to come now is massively reduced and their drownings are down to zero though again drownings like if you if you applied this to somewhere like libya the number of drownings decreasing okay, doesn't there, mean there anything are, if uh, just tw- as of 2010 detention. there were 1400 people living on christmas island but that says population so i'm not sure if those are the people impounded or uh, how again many people... i'm thinking we're talking about where they come from so again if you stop the boats from libya then I don't really care if, like, if drownings go down, that means they're in Libya. They're in a, they're in detention centers, and facing human rights abuses where they might as well be dead. You're, anyway. you're not understanding, like it's so. Like someone just mentioned in the chat, when they stopped the boats, refugees, quote unquote, stopped flying into Indonesia, right? There was a draw for people to actually go to these countries, and that's what was happening. People that were, and I, I'm going to use Morocco as a context because that's where I've been on the ground, but I know it's happening in Libya too. People were going to these countries. They were going into these situations. They were putting themselves in situations where they were potentially going to go into capsized boats, where they were going into countries like Libya, where, yeah, if you get caught, you're probably going to have a pretty bad time. It's probably going to be horrible. But people are going into these situations because there is a draw there. There is a driver, which is the fact of open borders, the government. And, and you know, I don't blame these people because the government in Europe and NGOs, all these activists have been telling them for decades, yeah, open borders. Smugglers are telling them that too. Open borders. You come in, you're going to get a house. We're going to take care of you. Our home is for refugees. Everyone's got the signs out. You know, we reject no one. So they're going into these situations, uh, a few things are happening. One, they get caught anyways, doesn't matter what the policy in Europe is, and they go to a Libyan jail and it's horrible. Two, the boat capsizes and it's horrible. Three, they get across to Europe and they don't get any refugee status or any status at all because they were illegally migrating and didn't have a right to it. And they end up living under a bridge or getting killed well, in one of their more than More than half of the people get their claims eventually accepted. I think it's 40% immediately and then another 29% after Okay, that. so you so, still are left again, with you hundreds keep on, of thousands you keep on of people. Doing- I'm saying that's a problem, but I'm, I'm saying it's not worth sending a bunch of people who, in your words, who get their oh, claims wait, did you, accepted. Uh, what, what, what is the stat, the half of? Is it half of people that come by sea, or is it half of actual refugees, it's just, it's, or half of people who why make do you claims? Keep con- why, do you keep, why do you keep contrasting people who come by sea and with actual refugees? Because not everyone that comes by sea is an actual refugee. Plenty are just not everyone that, migrants. Not everyone that comes across in any way would be like an actual refugee, though, right? Yeah. You would sure. expect you would you would expect people coming from yeah, so sea what is, the what most is this, dangerous of, way. Of half the people who get accepted. Half the people who half, claim asylum. Half the people who claim right. asylum, right? So how many of that is the actual portion coming over? What do you mean the portion coming over? like the actual people coming over on boats that are trying to migrate to Europe, what percentage of those are actually get accepted as refugees? I don't really know if they would file that, would they? If they're like in the asylum process and they're gathering data saying we need to gather stats on asylum seekers who came by sea. Um, Asylum claims by sea, I don't know. Why does that matter though? Because again, like you, you keep saying like, actual okay. refugees versus you know people from both all right i i have to end this stream pretty soon here so i'll just really try to clarify no i'm I, i'm 20 minutes over i just realized it's but, fine it's and fine. i'm fine I, to talk to you again minutes. yeah I'm, I'm totally good to talk to you again but um no i'll just really clarify my position here there are a lot of people coming over i would say the majority based on what i have observed the majority that do not actually have any claim to refugee status 
that are not being processed in any meaningful way into the systems in Europe, whether they be in Greece, Italy, Germany, France, Spain. Mm. They are disappointed, rightfully so. They've been promised things by human traffickers that could never be fulfilled. In a lot of cases, they're homeless. In a lot of cases, they have no hope. In a lot of cases, they have no ability to work or make a living because they, once again, could not make any claim in these countries. And it is going to lead to disaster, both for these people and both for the European people. Because a lot of people that are miserable with no hope is dangerous in any situation. Doesn't matter what your skin color is, doesn't matter what your, da- what your gender is. A lot of people with absolutely no hope, no jobs, nothing that were given a, sold a lie, that is dangerous. That is dangerous anywhere you go. And there's going to be a lot of misery, a lot of disappointment, a lot of crime, which we are already seeing in these places. And uh, I mean, once again, just this year, the camp was literally burnt to the ground in Moria because the migrants, they were so pissed off with the situation they were in. And it is not good for anyone. And something needs to change. Something needs to change. And for that to even happen, for the problem in Europe right now to even be dealt with, they need to actually stop and just figure out what the hell is going on to pull a Trumpism here. Stop and figure out what the hell is going on. Yeah. Again, that doesn't mean you stop death. It just means you stop death at sea, right? You continue the deaths of people who would but, otherwise flee in places like Libya. But if you can't Algeria, help those people anyways, Indonesia. like if you can't, if you aren't helping those people in Europe anyways, you actually need to, it's like, you know, putting the mask on yourself. You can help them. The you let them claim you. asylum. No, but if you, you have can't no help them. space, Half of them if you have no resources accepted. to help asylum seekers because you have taken in so many people without actual claim and you're trying to help these people who are living on your streets, who have nothing to do, who have nothing to eat, if your systems are overwhelmed, you can't help anyone. And that is but what Europe is, is not right overwhelmed now. by refugees. Barely any refu- of the uh, portions of the refugees came to Europe. Europe is not over. Europe is a pretty rich country. You can process refugees. Europe is a rich country. <laughs> sorry, I'm just teasing. We're a rich continent. But, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm teasing. Uh, but let's see. Like even Merkel herself, who is super pro refugee policy, was like, "This is this is overwhelmed Germany." Let me see. Um, well, Merkel was saying that since 2010. She's yes. always pondered. No, uh, not the since 2010. Since. 10, 2010 was her multiculturalism has failed speech. I'm just looking up Christmas Island right now. Someone died, like an Iranian refugee died after the government recognized he was a refugee in Christmas Island. How did he and die? And there was a riot. That's fucking... Oh, there was a riot? It doesn't... Riots Once followed. again, these riots happen every day at the camps in Europe. Every day. I was barely allowed into Calais because they were like, they might just kill you. It's lawless in there. What were you saying about crime as well? Like, don't like refugees and migrants commit less crime than locals? No, that is. Uh, I think unless you adjust, <laughs> unless you would like, if you un- unless you don't adjust for age because they're younger and younger people commit more crime. No, they, they migrants commit more crime. Absolutely. Um, in, when you when you ille- don't illegals, adjust for age, illegals, right? of course. Um, when we're talking about actually accepted refugees, I, I reckon they wouldn't commit much crime. I'd agree mm. with you there. But no, illegal migrants in France, it's like disastrous there at the moment. But again, when you're talking about refugees, it's refugees who come across the sea, right? Like that's part of that's part of the people who become accepted as refugees. The small percentage that are accepted out of the... What small percentage? You said it was... You haven't like given the me the data of people with... that come over sea, just people who apply. And I don't doubt that, you know, even the fact that only does, half of the people that actually apply, make, if you come so to... half of the people that are applying are faking it, like, that's pretty shocking in itself. Again, well, that's because some countries consider Libya a safe port and then deport them, so that's kind of a problem as well, because Libya is definitely not a safe port. But, so you'd actually expect the accepted claims to be higher. <sighs> I'm just wondering, like, Generation Identity's mission okay. was to be a rescue mission and send them to Libya. Do you agree with that or not? I'd have to go back and look no. at the policy at the time. I genuinely would. Um, because if the policy at the time was that that was considered a safe port and that that was the maritime Libya law, then yes. Lib- if that was not the maritime law at the time and it was not considered a safe port at the time, 
uh, then no, because that wouldn't be against maritime law. As I've said, my support is for migration and maritime law and what nations have done since the dawn of time, no matter who they are in any country. You go to anywhere in the world, China, even African countries, Mexico, you ask people what they think about illegal migrants in their country and they'll be pissed off. I know, because I've gone, even in Mexico, I've been there and they're like, oh, you know, illegal migrants coming through here, it's its really irritating. When I was in Turkey, same thing. They're like these traffickers come in and these people, they rob us. And uh, like, it's, it's a really, I know people don't like to hear that because there's this weird perception that everyone who migrates or everyone who comes across the sea is like this perfect angel, but that's just not the reality. And in fact, this policy of just let everyone in without checks and balances really hurts actual Did refugees I ever say no checks and, and migrants too, who are Did living in camps no with balances? violent criminals who are trying to escape their home country under the current open borders, basically open borders policies happening now. No, you didn't say checks and balances, but you haven't really explained how your checks and balances are taking place other than deport everyone who doesn't have a legitimate uh, migration claim, which doesn't make sense when they've all destroyed their identification. Well, that's why, again, like the UN law is that you assist people who don't have travel documents and you find a way. There can be paths to citizenship as well. But again, Libya was in civil war when um, when uh, Generation Identities bring them back to Libya mission. I, like I said, I, if I'll go, I'll go look into the policy on that. We will set a chat after I've looked at after I've finished your video and I've looked up the Libyan policy at the time and the uh, EU policy and Italian policy. Um, but yeah, I just, like my friend, I, I don't know your, your policy of just, you know, f send them back on airplanes. Like, first of all, I don't think they should. Okay. Again, like if they're, but that's for people who fail their claims and have like, we know where they're from and they're not from a country that you should be fleeing. So, but again, like but there is a question they... that can be asked about with the people who arrive, but I, I think like sending people back to Libya is just not an option. But, th but then, then your migration policy becomes anyone can come in until we can prove that they don't belong here, which is no con no sane country's immigration policy because it doesn't again, work. Again, most we have of to, them Even if you have no identification, Europe. nothing, we have to sit here and figure out a way to prove that you aren't a refugee uh, who we should pay all of your wages, pay you to live here, like support you, give you language courses, that country will collapse with that policy, any country with that policy. Well, again, policy. that's that's why, again, why the first safe country is kind of useless, because if people have, like, a language that they can speak in a different country, then they should probably go there. Like, if, you, uh -huh. if you're if you a Syrian and your second language is English, you probably shouldn't be living in Hungary or Turkey. Like, you should probably go to, like, you'd probably go to, like, the UK or something. So, yeah, I'm fine with that again, because we take it, like, again, like, most of these countries as well take in barely any refugees the uk has like has had less than forty thousand since the crisis started so that's like less than ten thousand a year isn't it it's really low anyway i can't remember the exact number and we have a labor shortage so uh, let me see this whole thing about a continent being full like one of the richest continents someone in chat is saying forty thousand. that's huge like yeah this is just like, how do you justify that? What the uh, according to UN statistics, at the end of 2020, the UK uh, had accepted 132,000 refugees with 80,000 pending asylum cases. Yeah, since when was this? Um, that was 2020. No, in the year, in the year they received 26,000 asylum applications over the same period. So this would be since somewhere. So at the end, there were. I'm checking people, right but... now the actual document. How many? You're probably right. I probably checked the forty thousand from a while ago, but again, it's still low. Even two hundred thousand over that period is low. How many dependents do you want? Because you realize asylum seekers are dependent, and like they they For should be. For an of course, average, if you if you are fleeing a country from war and you in a lot of cases sometimes can't speak the language you have no ability to set your feet some people will be single mothers fleeing that can't work they're going to be dependent and again uh the process in the uk is supposed to be six months i think that's the average um the problem is that there's a work ban on claimants that i think should be lifted i think they should be allowed to work straight away 
So yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I agree that they should be utilized as workers because they're good for that. Oh yeah, I think your numbers are a bit low for the UK. I'll have to. Yeah, they probably are. But again, like it's still like the numbers that we take are still low. Even when I'm looking at this, like with receiving twenty six thousand applications in twenty twenty one, that's that's quite low for a year. I I just don't know if I agree with and that. And they do want to work. Like that's quite typical of refugees. Like they do work. I don't. I don't know think there's if... many like. I don't really know the rates of like refugees who get accepted and then claim welfare. That's I've never heard that. Even even right wingers have never mentioned that as a trend. What? Of course, well, of course they get assistance initially. Of course, like that makes sense. Yeah, they if get you assistance, are a refugee, yeah. well, yeah, so you don't have to claim welfare because you're getting assistance as an asylum seeker initially. Yeah, but that's on, well, the assistance is only six months and the assistance in the UK is, it's uh, £5.64 for food. So it's quite low. Yeah, it looks like we'll have to, I'm, I'm going to get those UK rates as well. Also, how much I can did see you the, say? They get five pounds sixty four a day for food, food, sanitation, and clothing. That all of this sounds sus. How much? That's, this money? is from your source. This is from the same UNHCR UK. Oh my god! Why is that sus? Five pounds sixty four a day for food. That sounds pretty typical of the way UK treats <laughs> refugees. No, that does sound not sus. For, unless they're feeding them for, as well. Like, what? no, I said for food. They, yeah, I no, said I, for food. Okay, asylum support. So they you get, get housing, forty they pounds don't. for each person per household. I'm at, I'm on the UK Gov website now. Yeah, thirty nine sixty three per week per person, which makes five sixty four a day for food, sanitation, and clothing. But yeah, this was the source that you got the. Okay, you asylum support uk.gov what you'll get you can ask for somewhere to live a cash allowance uh or mm -hmm. both as an asylum seeker house you'll be given somewhere to live if you need this could be in a flat a house a hostel or a bed and breakfast you cannot choose where you live um cash support you'll get 40 pounds for each person in your household this will help you pay for things you need like food clothing and toiletries your allowance will be loaded onto a debit card each week you'll be able to use the card to get cash from a cash machine if you've been refused asylum, you'll still be given the payment card for food, clothing, and toiletries, and somewhere to live. Um, if you're a pregnant mother, you get an extra three pounds per week. That's actually not great, is it? <laughs> yeah, um, someone in your um, chat is uh, reeing about housing. It's usually hard to let properties that the council tenants don't want to live in. So, yeah, that's... Unfortunately, that is a problem where we have like empty council houses in the UK that people don't want to live in. Okay, I'm going to have to look into these actual stats and how much it costs to live in the UK. I also reckon... Why is that? Why is, did that surprise you? Pardon? Why did that surprise you? Why did it surprise me? Five pounds a day? Because five Pretty pounds a day... It? Yeah, that's, that's a short... That's why I don't actually think... That, that can't possibly be the actual number people are being given if they have been granted asylum. No, no. I said if when they're applying. I said for their... If you're granted asylum, then you just get to work and you, you know, you do your job. You don't need the money anymore. Okay, I'll have to look more into this data. Obviously, so this isn't welfare, but yeah, like, like, so again, like, yeah. So when you're claiming asylum, when they're vetting you, you get five pounds sixty four a day for food, sanitation, clothing. Why is that? Well, <laughs> yeah, you get free, that's... like you said, you get housing and. Uh... Yeah, you get housing. I know it's it's not it's not terrible, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, like like I said, there would have to be more than five pounds per day. Why? Why would it have to be? I've lived off, like, well, I haven't had to, but I've, it's possible. You can go and buy Smart Price and just be kind of, you know, I guess you'd be a bit hungry and there are food banks. Let me see. Do you get... Hmm. Sorry, I'm just doing some reading. It's okay, I'm just gonna wait for someone in chat to say something funny. <laughs> 
Someone said I have an amateur style. That is true. I'm not a public speaker. I'm enjoying talking to you though. I know a lot of my chat will probably hate you. And you know what? You were a bit of a cunt in your video, if I'm being honest, but uh, I'm enjoying talking to you. I was, but you were, you were making cunty claims. I Excuse me, your claim what, what, what that I made thing? up my entire Panos interview was grappling at straws. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. You were basically trying to assert it was like some- I said that you made up that, and you exaggerated the lead up, which I think is true. I can't prove it, but you know. It's, <laughs> I know you can't. <laughs> And I definitely don't think the lawyer admitted to money laundering to a pair of strangers. But... Absolutely did. I know. Did you send it to the police then? We did actually. Yeah. Did you see that? Um, like, well, you you said you so you've seen that part of the video, right? Or have you only watched whatever you? No, watched I've I've never watched uh, my video. Oh, you mean your video? I my watched video, yeah, um yeah. I watched that bit. I, I whatever whatever we watched on the stream. Yeah, I think I watched a tiny bit past that where you mentioned um. Have Something you about been able charges? Had, I'm just interested. Have you did you be able to find some anything about Panos like after 2018? Because it's really, it's really hard. hard to find it's articles like on them. Shocking, hey. I know. I was looking up um all I could find was the two, which I find really tragic, is the two younger ERCI kids that are being mm. charged, but not Panos, who is in control of the whole thing. For some reason well, that's Panos the... stuff disappeared, but the two kids are on trial for ERCI. <laughs> well, it's because the money laundering charge was linked to their fundraising campaign. So Panos is actually implicated in that because it's his NGO. They raised funds for him. Yeah. But yeah, it was those two. And that's why, because I think the latest I found was Amnesty International did a review of the case in 2020. And they said that the investigation into those two people's bank accounts didn't uncover any wrongdoing. So that's that's in 2020. So far, they haven't uncovered any. Role the case there. is still ongoing. Uh, that's I the know, only I thing know. I could find. And apparently, like, and this doesn't surprise me because this was something that um, Ariel had kind of hinted at was using like military radios and military plates to get into restricted areas to pick up these migrants and to kind of collude and find out where they were illegally that was one of the charges on them they're claiming that it was a completely legal radio and they were just like able to get on military channels legally so that's the claim so we'll see what um is she charged goes into that yeah, she's, she is, yeah she is yeah i'm just skimming some stuff on her now she got a lot of death threats after that video who did ariel did she i didn't if that's true i don't support that but yeah, did she so. actually like, yeah, apparently. I think so many the... people like make that up 24 7. It's hard to believe. It's like DGG sent me death threats. Here's these fake screenshots. So I, I really... don't know, right? <laughs> when a bunch of Nazis like raid my Discord, that used to happen when I made like more alt righty videos, and they um, they never target me. They never DM me. They never at me. They always at the people in my server with female profile pictures. Oh, I gotta, gotta get the they femme. Come into my Discord to, they come into my Discord to attack women. It's really weird. And I just got left alone. All right, so I'm finding I'm finding a few um, bits of information that are saying it's higher. So I'm gonna have to sit here and be boring after this stream and look into all the information on migrant housing and benefits. I wouldn't be surprised if there was also a. I'll just say this honestly. Um, <laughs> my chat's gonna re. But I actually, when I was a youngin, I did volunteering with uh, refugees in Canada and asylum seekers. Um, and we went out and did shops for them and helped them cook food and stuff. So there was a lot of, uh, you know, private support as well. It was with a, with a church group. So I wouldn't be surprised if, I'd hope at least that it was mixed with that, if that is the case for genuine asylum seekers, of course. So I will have to look into it because as we know, as this chat certainly know, the media make pretty shocking claims. <laughs> A lot. Well, this source is from the home office, so... Right, right. And I'm going to look into if there are compounding factors to that, if there is food given to them as well on top of that. This does say that... Um, sorry, I'm opening. I mean, I'm not making like a massive moral claim about the money. I just, I was just interested that it surprised you so much. They can probably go no, to of food Of course, banks. because I've lived in the UK and, and five pounds is not much, obviously. It's not much for food. No, no it's not much for food at all. And sanitation and clothing. And so yeah, toilet no, of course paper. Not. And, yeah. yeah, which is why I want to look into it and see if there's like extra extras given to them, if there's actual food given to them as well, brought to them. Um, I've gone to I a guess few AIDS, of these. 
So Blankets wait, would be cheap. Ahead. I guess I guess AIDS t-shirts would be cheap. <laughs> Sorry, go on. Yeah, no, because I've gone to a few of these places and they have had like the trucks outside distributing things. Certainly in the UK, we've got because we were gonna do a video interviewing people in the UK before before the unfortunate UK event with me happened. Uh, so I will have to do a bit more research to that. But if that is true, if it is that they only get five pounds and they are legitimate asylum seekers uh, that have like gotten status and everything, that's messed up. If it's just people that have applied and it's a bunch of um, people that have just came in on boats and they have no idea, I can see how it could be difficult to support. I think they've got like nearly uh, at one point it was like 800 to a thousand coming in per day. I can see how that would be a really difficult system to support and why they would have to decrease the amount they're giving to people. Still, even just housing those people would be really challenging. Can you at least acknowledge that? What if it's how many people a year? It was 800 people for per day coming over the channel. Um. Yeah, of course that would be challenging, but again, there is a, there's a surprising amount of empty housing in the UK, and again, it's like, um, the sooner that these people get processed and uh, something's decided with them, it, if they, the sooner they are allowed to work and actually pay their own way, the better, so. Uh, yeah, but again, like, this whole thing about legitimate asylum seekers as well, like, you're not, you're either an asylum seeker or you're not. You either claim asylum or you don't. So, again, it's like... Like everyone who claims asylum is a legitimate asylum seeker, it's just whether or not they get accepted. Well, no, like even the UK website here with their pittance that they're giving admit, um, mm. like even if you have no claim to asylum, you still get paid. Yeah, because you had that. You you have to get. You have to be here while whilst you're claiming asylum, which is why I think the work ban should be lifted. I think the, yeah, if you're coming over saying you want to work, you should work. Yeah. And we have a labor shortage in the UK, so Brexit and all. Um, I mean, <laughs> that is a I... whole different conversation about creating an immigrant slave class that we could have. It's bad here. No, Canada, they should get but... paid. No, they should get they should get paid for their work. Obviously, like, will they? Like... As in, do you really think that, like, right now, anyone who's paid minimum wage is a recent migrant here in Canada, and it's literally like a class system? What, as in like they're underpaid or as what? in they are the all the lowest paid workers in a country and migration is typically supported because they know these people will just work low paying jobs but i mean that's, yeah, that's a whole um, different conversation for another day i know it sounds like we need the immigrant unions to join with the local unions that would be nice but uh, all right uh, we can get to terrorism immigrant unions and uh let me look into these actual libyan laws I've got my notes here. We've got Libyan laws. We've got uh, the UK rates. Um, actually, that's... Oh, the mismanagement waste. Whether that was... Mm. What was the actual documentation there? And if you have the documentation there for the Aquarius, if you find it for the actual case, I would love that. If you find it for actual Panos case as well, impossible to find, but I'm looking. Uh, but yeah, I appreciate it. I don't know why I need to, because I'm just I'm, like, I don't know why I need to, because I'm responding to your I didn't say you have to. Claim, I'm saying it's... if you happen to come across it. Yeah, yeah. If, you, mean, have it, if you have it in your documents, I'd appreciate that. Thank you for the gift sub. Thank you. Or yeah, I want, I want to move on. I, I want to move on. I, I, I want to move yeah, on. I've, All I've right. I, you're welcome to. No worries. I'll watch. Thank I'll you. probably watch the rest of your, your video another time. And you have a good night, my friend. Yeah, and yourself. Take care. Cheers. Bye-bye.